we are going to be talking about criticism, confidence, and the imposter syndrome with organizational psychologist and author, Dr. Kim Perkins. And for those of you that have not met me, I am Jamie Thomason. I am a simulation specialist here at Mersion, and I have the honor of bringing thought leaders and practitioners and researchers and experts in the field, like all of you, together uh, for this beautiful virtual roundtable series. And uh, I not only want to welcome all of you to our roundtable series, but I also today, as it is June 2nd, want to say welcome to June. Now I realize I personally am not bringing you the month, but uh, <laughs> because it does represent so many things, I just kind of want to take a moment and acknowledge that something a little different than we, we normally do. June focuses on so many things. Uh, it includes Juneteenth, uh, which is also known as Freedom Day, as you know, celebrating emancipation. It offers us a time to reflect and, and reminds us of truly the importance of equality and inclusivity for all. Um, and June is also Pride Month, where we get to focus on our LGBTQ community. Um, so I mentioned a minute ago about connecting on LinkedIn. And this month, I would love to invite all of you to share with me on LinkedIn what it is that you're reading or watching or uh, participating in or, or suggesting to others as part of your time of reflection and your growth as a community. Now, that's something that we actually did as a company at Mersion um, to honor Juneteenth last year, and I just found it so helpful. So I would love to, to spread that out to all of us and share with each other what we're doing uh, for that. And so I'll thank you in advance for, for those that, that take me up on that offer. Um, and June is also named after Juno, the goddess of spring and growth. It symbolizes the welfare of women. And then we are not just talking about women today. Uh, it will be part of what we talk about, but we are hearing from one of the most fascinating and inspiring women that I have met, Dr. Kim Perkins. And Kim joins us today with um, more than 10 years of experience in leader development. She has a PhD in positive organizational psychology. She is a former journalist and a former speed skater, a three-time winner of the world's longest skate race. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, and she is also the author of Winner Take None, Rethinking Competitiveness for the New Economy, which will be hitting the shelves the end of August. Hello, I'm so excited to be here with everybody. Thank you for that lovely introduction. For those that are, are brand new to us, we are VR for social effectiveness. We provide human in the loop simulations for essential workplace skills. We started out in education, expanded into learning and development, diversity, equity, and inclusion, doing work with sales, service, healthcare, government, and defense, a little bit of everything. Uh, we do this by blending live human interaction with artificial intelligence to provide a safe space for learners to practice those challenging conversations and build the confidence and competence to go out and, and have them in the real world. Um, I invite you, if you'd like to learn more, just reach out to me. But uh, right now, I just want to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Kim Perkins. Anyway, so today, criticism, confidence, and imposter syndrome, and this is one of my very favorite things to talk about because this is something that so many, uh, we, we associate this as something that women feel, but actually the research shows that this is something that everybody feels um, and wrestles with in their own work life is the kind of feedback they're getting. Everybody wants to be confident about what they're doing. And, and a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people feel a little bit of that pull that people call the imposter syndrome. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that, what that means and what that doesn't and what we can do about it. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about what it means to have imposter syndrome. So this term has been around since the 1970s. And this, um, this idea, it's, it's not really a diagnosable syndrome, but it's the idea that you feel like you're in a little bit over your head. Like the, when, when you have success, that you're attributing it to something that's outside of yourself. Like you only get, like I had a speed skating um, person I coached a long time ago who made this incredible accomplishment. She made the world team after years of trying. And I said, this is fantastic. You've been wanting this for years. And, you, and finally you made the top four, you made the world team. And she said, well, the only reason I made it was because Helen didn't show up. It's like, what do you mean? Well, if Helen had been there, she would have beat me on this. Or, and they said, well, 
um, you know, I think that that might be a little bit of the imposter syndrome here because the idea is that you and your skills aren't good enough to make it, that the only reason you're doing this is because something else happened in the world that permitted you to be here. So I love this slide with this little girl who's playing fire chief, but obviously doesn't really feel like a fire chief. And that's really what people talk about with the imposter syndrome. So the, the thing with the imposter syndrome that people get wrong, however, is thinking that it's necessarily a lack of confidence in your abilities. And a lot of the research shows that that's not really what is at the root of imposter syndrome. Um, so we're gonna dive a little bit more into that today. What, um, when, so everybody, however, wants to feel this kind of confidence. Everybody wants to feel like you know what you're doing and you can, um, and people around you see you for your strengths and, um, and understand how you, fit into the bigger picture. That's kind of what everybody wants in the world. However, there's um, been a lot of books, especially in the last couple of years about how women in particular, they are directed at women about um, boosting women's confidence at work. And a lot of people have been suggesting things that we need to do in our own HR systems to make sure that women get the resources that they need to develop, that women um, feel, feel like they can bring their whole selves to work and not leave half of themselves at the door. And uh, these, these things have been all, you know, I think that these are worthy things to talk about, but that's not really where the roots of this, uh, both imposter syndrome and a, what a lack of confidence come, come from. So a lot of times um, people talk about programs, especially reaching women, that they, uh, it's like a fix the women approach. Meaning if we just get women thinking about it the way men think about it or women thinking about it differently, then everything will be fine. And I'm really against this approach because A, it puts the burden on the people who are not doing as well in the system and that doesn't work very well. And B, uh, that's not necessarily the root of the problem. So what I want to talk about today in terms of where imposter syndrome can come from and also why people aren't feeling the confidence that they would like to feel, I want to talk about the nature of the feedback and the criticism that people um, receive that is sometimes based on who they are, it's based on identities, and it's based on assumptions that people make. So going back here for a second to imposter syndrome, um, one of the hallmarks of imposter syndrome is feeling as though people aren't um, are going to find out that you aren't any good at what you're doing, that you're somehow a fraud and that you don't actually have the skills to be here. And I'm wondering, you know, has, has anybody out there experienced this? Has anybody ha had that real feeling of being like, oh, they don't know that I'm really not qualified or that I really shouldn't be doing this? Is that something that anybody's had and experienced it? I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure we all have, and feel free, I'll, I'll put my, I'll raise my hand there. <laughs> Great. Um, I, yep, so, I'm seeing now, okay, there you go. I'm seeing lots of hands, <laughs> lots of hands go up now. Absolutely. Excellent. And so, you know, it, it's not always your skills that are the thing that you're worried about here. And that, that's one of the things that I think people often misunderstand. It's not necessarily, can I do the job? It's, Will they accept me as I am? Will they accept a person in my position? Will they accept, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mixed race woman of color. Um, I'm sometimes a lot older than the people that I end up working with in a tech situation. I worry about those things. Not so much necessarily do I have the skills, but will they be able to see me? Will they be able to see me and include me and be able to use what I have? Um, and this brings up a lot of things, I think, um, around like the concept of stereotype threat, um, where, where we're worried that we're going to confirm stereotypes about the groups that we're in by our behavior. And that then puts extra pressure on us to perform. And then that has the opposite effect of then reducing our ability to perform because we're worried about confirming the stereotypes people have of you. So again, as, as, a, as a person who's older than the average tech person, I feel like I have to be on top of the tech every moment or, or else somebody might notice that I'm older, right? And then that would be bad. And that often means for, for me a lot more fumbling. And that's that cycle that we get into that, again, going back to the 70s, people associate with imposter syndrome where you are being kind of self-sabotaging. 
And so in the 70s, people really didn't understand the idea that this was um, a dynamic, was that some, this was something that happened uh, between people rather than something internally to yourself. And I'm not going to fault them for that. This was, there was a lot less computing power to really tease out these relationships the way there is now. And so um, there wasn't quite such a fo social focus on it. But now we know that there, um, it's a dynamic between people who are giving feedback and receiving feedback and that all day long, whether it's official or unofficial feedback, we're always out there trying to figure out how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis other people or what people think of us. Um, and, and so it's always a fluid and dynamic thing. And I, and I feel like this is really important to understand is that if you're, whatever you're experiencing with this, it's not just you. So it's not just people in your position. It's not something you're doing to yourself, which I think is a source of more shame for people. It's more that there's a dynamic where people are responding to you in a certain way, sometimes because of your actions, sometimes because of your identity. And the point, or the, and what you have to do is kind of tease that out to see what is um, noise that is just the way people perceive you in the world and what is something actionable that you really need to do about it. So um, a lot of the older advice we have for imposter syndrome is really very person focused. And it's, um, you know, we're doing our power poses and we're trying to influence how the world sees us and, um, and take back our power. And I want us to do that. I want us to take back our, our, our power when we're feeling kind of one down in a situation. But it's also important to know that some of that isn't going to go away. You can't control all of that. You can't always control how you were received. And so when I work with, with um, younger people in their own leader development, people go through stages. In the beginning part, everybody wants to make sure that they're doing it well enough, that they're meeting everybody else's criteria, you know, that they're be able to achieve the, um, at, at, at a standard level, that they can do this. And then as you go along in, in, in your life as a leader, it becomes more that you, uh, what you want to accomplish and what, who are you being in this situation? And are you achieving your own goals? Because all leaders attract criticism and all leaders get feedback that is kind of stupid and that is not really what you want. And there's a certain amount where you can't control that. And you have to be able to let that go so that you can focus on what you do want and what you can control. So that makes sense right there. How do we have any questions at this moment? Not right now, just uh, as I said, lots of folks that seem to really understand and agree and uh, I'll put myself on, so, uh, but I, I love the, somebody said, uh, the, yep, the little green man on my shoulder. <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah. Marcin shared, this was my experience when I landed uh, my first job in the C-suite. And uh, Joe said, my philosophy was, if they're shouting at you, you must be doing something right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And at this point, this is a time when it's really important to surround yourself with other people who understand this journey or on, are on this journey with you. Because there's going to be, again, the, more, the higher you go in the organization or the more impact you're having, if you're a solo practitioner or, or whatever level you are, um, the more people are going to see you and they're going to criticize. And that doesn't mean that you have to take all of that on board. And so a lot of it is about figuring out what you want to actually take on board and versus what um, is stuff that you can leave there that is not part of that. And that's really, in, in terms of the soul of confidence, it's about knowing your worth and what you have to offer and rather than being all attached to, are you controlling how people see you for whatever reason? And so that's why so much, in my opinion, so much leader development focuses on your own values and your own goals, because uh, you're always going to get criticized. Um, and I think Eleanor Roosevelt had a great quote about this, which, which was, uh, do, what is, do what you believe is right for you will be criticized either way. So I love that quote, by the way. Is it good? Favorite. But yeah, and I just, because uh, uh, Marina had mentioned, said, working from a place of being in integrity with ourselves is number one. It is, it is. 
So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that taking making criticism is any easier. So, I want to talk about when, and I apologize for the car horns in my neighborhood. This is I'm here in Los Angeles, and things happen. Um, what? Um, when you get that criticism, there may be some signal in with all of that noise. So I don't, what I don't want is for people to just start ignoring everything that people say about them. And I know that, that you know, on social media, we make a big deal about like girl bosses and we're going to just brush it all off, right? But that does, but the problem is that that actually inhibits our ability to develop a lot of the time because um, a lot of research has shown that women tend to not seek out feedback as much as men. When, when women are in a very male-oriented situation, they will often seek out feedback. Um, and that is you, sometimes useful, sometimes not, because sometimes, especially in male-oriented uh, industries and situations, you know, like engineering, sciences, et cetera, um, what ends up happening is that the the quote unquote male way of doing things and the traditional way of doing things ends up being the way of doing things when there are actually far more creative and um, better options for how women get things done. Because again, we're saying it's a dynamic and people don't, um, where, where people are taking, you know, you can't separate yourself from the identity. You can't just as a female person, for example, do it the way a guy would do it and expect to get the same results. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and so we have to take our identity into account with this in the way that people receive us. So um, when we're getting a lot of feedback in male environments in particular, it tends to be on style. And when I say in male environments, that doesn't mean necessarily from male people, but I mean in ways where the way to do it is something that perhaps has more male masculine quality, where it's very agentic, where you have to go in there and be a B word sometimes. You know, and or where um, taking making sure that everybody's taken care of and a, and a different style of leadership isn't necessarily the way that we're doing things. So in very hierarchical situations, I found this in Hollywood a lot because Hollywood is very hierarchical in medical situations. Um, and so one of the things that um, I found is a lot of women leaders getting criticized on style rather than substance, and it's really important for women and for everybody really to be able to push back on that criticism and get it to be more about substance. And if it isn't about substance, maybe that's not something that you need to take on board. So I, I, there was a, I worked in a, a science company that I will not name, where we were doing a simulation that we uses, um, this used a live actor, which is much like what Mersion does with, with avatars, which makes it so much more accessible. They used a live actor to um, and the and the the group project in this leader development course was to come up with a plan to persuade the live actor who was playing the CEO about a plan that you wanted to implement, and so there were five groups, and of four of them, um, they selected one for each. They each group selected one person to go up and talk to the CEO who was an actor. Four of the tables were male. One of the tables was female. The four men all went up to persuade the CEO and. It was a disaster. They didn't use any of the principles we were trying to teach them. They, um, the CEO, by the way, was female. Sometimes people tried flirting with her. That was exactly what we don't want. It was, um, and nobody was really connecting with her, which is what we were trying to do. And so the table of women sent up a woman to do it. She connected with her right away. She made sure she empathized. She understood the situation from the CEO's point of view and presented her thing. And immediately. The CEO said, yes, let's do it. And so the female group was the only one who was able to actually get through on in this exercise and do it right. Everybody else failed. And so you'd think everybody would be like, yay, women, you did it. And in fact, the guys were grumbly. They were so upset. They said, well, this is obviously cheating. They said, well, she didn't. Why, why was it cheating? Well, she didn't do it right. You're supposed to do it like this. And they talked about the ways that they're supposed to go in there and take charge of things. And they're supposed to tell her what they're supposed to do. And all of this very masculine oriented thing. Whereas the only person who was actually effective was doing it from a more feminine uh, connective style. And I always think about that because even though the person who, who achieved the goal in this leadership uh, class, um, she even though she's the only one who achieved the goal, she was the one who got the most criticism as well. And it's infuriating, but that is often what we're up against. 
And we have to learn for ourselves how not to take that on board and not to get organized around that so that we can do what we need to do and be effective in our own style. So um, thinking about the feedback that we want, we, you know, we, we know that we want all the things that we know we want about feedback, right? We want it to be observable behavior. We want it to be actionable behavior, something that, that you can, if you're going to tell somebody something, it has to be something you can take action on rather than a feeling you get or something just feels wrong to you. That is kind of a, a dog whistle for me that there might be something about an identity or, a, or an interaction that's going on that isn't really objective feedback about you that you need to take on. Um, and it needs to be outcome oriented. So what is this actually going to change for people when we get out there? If you want, so if you want me to change my behavior, I need to know what's the action that we want to have at the end of it. And that way, since research also shows that women use a lot more creativity in their um, ways of achieving their goals in leadership than men do, then that way we can use what, all of what we have in our whole identities to be able to come up with something that will work rather than have it be just about style. So that those are my main things that I wanted to make sure we talk about today. So I'm ready for some questions if you have them. One of the things that, that I'm seeing sort of a consistent across the thread is the observation that, that these criticisms come not only from men, but from women as well. Uh, and yes. that talked about finding uh, that sometimes criticism would come from senior women that want to be praised for being women in leadership, but are threatened by younger female point of view. Yes, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about that. So one, you know, I'm a representative of an older person in, in organizational culture. So when I was raised in the 80s, and I know that for if, you're, if you were born in the 80s, and I know this for myself, is that anything that happened before you were born is like water under the bridge, who even cares, right? But in this case, we're all still here together and it still is impacting us. So if you think about like with your own life, that the things that happened when you were five and 10, and 15 years old are still impacting you. It's that way with the older ladies in your life too. It's not just you, we haven't worked past it. You know, we're still impacted by that. And so, you know, as an older lady myself, when I was growing up in the seventies, I was literally told, oh, it's too bad you're so smart because you're a girl and you're just gonna be a wife and mother. You know, these are things that happened to me. These are things, you know, in the eighties, people told me that, um, you know, everybody knew that business was male and male was business. And so if you wanted to be in business, you had to act more like a male. And we know, we know from research, so much research, that that is a terrible way to do it. Because when you're departing, when you're, when you're bifurcating from one of some of your own qualities that you value, it reduces your creative thinking. Um, it puts more stress on you. And it's, it's just exactly the opposite of how we're doing business these days, where the value is with authenticity and trustworthiness. And so these are all things that, that women leaders who are older all, are all still combating and wrestling with in, their, in themselves. And even though it would be lovely that we had all the answers, we, a lot of us think, you know, I, I like to think that I've kept up with the times more, but a lot of us really are still relying on those early lessons we learned, which is that you cannot do it in a sort of way. You cannot wear glitter to work, right? You, there, <laughs> that there's, a lot of things like this that you just don't do is let me tell you how it is, honey, because, you know, I want to share my wisdom that is hard earned with you, but it doesn't, you know, when, when you're younger, it's like, this is not what we're doing now. Of course I can wear glitter to work. What are you talking about? You know? And, and so it, it can come out as upholding the values that oppressed you, you know, and that's, um, and I feel in some ways that that's kind of unfair because we had to do a lot of things that people don't have to do. And we worked hard so that they wouldn't. And I'd rather not do, you know, but it's very hard to change these things that are in, in your, that are in, in your history. But I, I'd love for us to all think of it that we're all struggling with the different ways that we have been. And I'm going to use a big old word here that we have been wrestling with the patriarchy um, and trying to work our identity into it so that we can accomplish our goals and work with the system as it is. And, um, and sometimes that comes out as sounding like the, the older women are, are, are upholding oppressive values and 
um, I would love if we could all have some compassion for that. And if you are a person who's done that, and I have done that, I have absolutely done that. I remember telling a very talented young woman, but the beginning of my my career before I really understood what was going on. I remember saying, no, 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 you got to pay your dues first. You're too young to have anybody trust you with any decision making. And I'm like, oh, I think about this now. Why did I say that? That was so wrong. Um, but but that dynamic, I, I can I, I know how that dynamic must feel. And we, we, but now there's such a change from it's such a change from when we started our careers. Please be patient and know that it's not about you. It's probably about us and ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, and I, th I think that kind of ties in because uh, David said, what part do you think trauma plays in the effectiveness mm. of senior leaders? Oh, what a great question. And I could talk for you too, for two hours on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think the trauma has a really big deal because, you know, when, when a lot of leader development that I've done, we start with, okay, who are your role models? You know, what is your kind of, what's your um, theory whether you it's official or not, you know, what's your theory about what good leadership looks like? And a lot of time it will be coming from places that were doing bad things. You know, people will have really tough leaders who uh, made everybody feel bad, but got everybody organized around their agenda, you know, or people who are very Machiavellian in mind for leadership. And that's are often very traumatic experiences for them. And yet that's what hell is held up as good leadership because, um, for whatever reason, the person got their way. <laughs> and that, so I think that trauma plays a huge amount, a huge role in this. And, and especially as one, as senior leaders, as one goes up the scale, and this has been shown from top management team studies, is that things do get more Machiavellian and people are more um, playing a game more, more competitive. It's more about my own interests. Um, and that's not the only way that this can happen, because as leaders age, they also tend to think about taking care of their flock more and tend more toward servant leadership as well. But that there, there's, a, there's a real game happening at senior leadership. And so this, these are some of the things that senior leaders are dealing with. And then anytime the chips are down, people go back to perhaps traumatic patterns. And that's very easy for people to do. So I think it's a huge topic honestly, and I'm one that I'm very interested in for how we can, you know, move everything forward that requires looking at things differently on an individual level as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Elizabeth said, how does psychological safety relate to imposter syndrome? Um, you know, with, with imposter syndrome specifically, it's going to be about wanting um Feeling like you belong is so much more, I think, a modern way of thinking about imposter syndrome. So psychological safety makes a big is a is a big deal. If you're trying to hit all your marks and be perfect right out of the gate, which I hope you're not, because that's not going to happen, and you're just going to disappoint yourself and be very tired. And I say this as a recovering perfectionist. Um, what there, there's let me see. I lost my train of thought. What um, Great example here, right? So this way, what I'm doing is I'm calling it out and saying, look, I did this as opposed to trying to paper it over and pretend that I've got it all perfectly together. No, that's, thank you for that. And, and that's <laughs> you know, I, I think part of, of something that, they, that we have to do for ourselves is allowing ourselves to be human, you know, and, and, and to make, to, to do those things where we we lose our train of thought and and we were talking about psychological safety uh, yeah. and, and imposter syndrome. And I know uh, we have lots of other questions that have come in a little lower. We're gonna uh, get to those. I promise we're gonna try to get to, yeah. to as many as we can. And I I'll, I'll what, just, what was even labeled thing. big question. So I'm gonna <laughs> save it for the end. Um, I'll just, I'll, let, me, let me just real quick finish the psychological safety one. Yeah. So with the psychological safety um, thing, so much of it has to do with the, the ability to feel like you're okay if you make a mistake or you mess up, that you're not going to get fired over every little thing or that it's not gonna cause a lot of gossip or that it's gonna reduce your, your reputation somehow. So that idea that we're all figuring it out here together is really what the thing that works in, in cur current situations that are very dynamic and where really nobody knows what's going on and you can't do it the way you did it the past 20 years. Thanks. Excellent.
Thank you. Uh, Deb said, what are some other ways to overcome imposter syndrome? And I think that would actually be a nice segue into our simulation that we're going to do, because we're actually going to let Kim just jump into the hot seat and have a conversation with someone who's uh, perhaps a putting her in a position that, that might encourage that imposter syndrome. And we're going to see how she can handle that situation and, and uh, advocate for herself and, and, and help herself and others overcome that. So I'm going to invite our uh, avatar host to come on. And I do promise we're going to, we're going to do more Q and A's, but I think this just might be a, a nice, fun, interesting way to kind of answer that question. So uh, we've got Nina here. Hi, Nina. Hi, Jamie. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm, you know, we've got so many questions uh, and thoughts to look at after this. So I want to go ahead and be respectful of everybody's time and ability to do that. I'm going to go ahead, go off camera and just leave Kim in your capable hands, Nina. Okay. Hi, Kim. How are you? Good. How's it going, Nina? Pretty good, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen now with uh, a vignette of the scenario that we're going to practice. Great. All right, so in this conversation that we're about to practice, you've been in your current position for a year and it's time for your performance review with Supervisor Mitchell. You're unclear what to expect from the conversation because Mitchell has not offered much feedback in the past. Your desired outcome is to understand Mitchell's feedback and come to an agreement on a more productive feedback schedule moving forward. Are there any questions about the scenario before I send you in to talk to Mitchell? Nope, not so far. Okay, great. So when you see Mitchell, the conversation will have begun and I will come back to check on you in a few minutes. I may also pause the uh, conversation mid, uh, midway through just so that we have more time for Q&A at the end because I know there are a lot of questions and a lot of people want to pick your brain. So that's great. All right. I will check on you in a few minutes. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Mitchell. Hey, Kim. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I can't complain. Uh, so I, I just wanted to have this meeting with you and uh, give you some some performance review here. Okay, great. Yeah, so before I start, I, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, do you have any questions about um, your, your, are there any questions that you have for me before we start? Um, questions that I have for you. Well, I'm really, as you can imagine, I'm really anxious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, I think you're really, really smart. You know, obviously you're, you're very capable and that's, that's not, that's not an issue or in doubt at all. Um, I just, I think my, my biggest, uh, my biggest feedback that I can give you um, is this, I just, I don't feel like you have the right leadership style as of right mm. now. So maybe we can work on that moving forward. Um, because as of right now, I, I just, I think you're really smart and I think you, you could be doing a really great job here, but um, you, mm. you got to develop the right leadership style, I think. Mm. Okay. So I have to develop the right leadership style, you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what have you seen that makes my leadership style look uh, not like the right one. Well, hey, you know, I, I like I said, I, I think you're doing a great job, and it's not anything that I can particularly define. But you know, mm. for for instance, I, I can give you I, an example of what I'm talking about, um, and, and that example would be uh, Brett. Right when he mm. when he goes in there to present, he doesn't ask a lot of questions. He just mm. tells them about his credentials, tells them what he should be paying attention to, and you know it's it's really impressive. It gets the job done, and those sort of initiatives get results. Mm. Okay, so you want so thinking about Brett, you want me to be more like Brett. Well. I, I guess I wouldn't say be more like Brett. Uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I, I do think that all of our leaders need to be strong and confident. Mm -hmm. 
strong and constant. Okay. Yeah. Have you, seen- you know, I just, I feel like you ask, you ask a lot of questions when you meet with clients, you know, you're very inquisitive and, and that's because you're, you're smart, right? Like you're, you're a smart person, but mm-hmm. I think that when you ask a lot of questions, it doesn't give off the impression that you're very confident. Mm, okay. Well, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions here. Okay. So in, in, in my trying to understand the feedback here, when uh, I'm thinking about Brett and yeah. I think that I have uh, actually gotten more sales this year than Brett. In fact, I, I as I recall, and I've got, um, I think I emailed you the report, there were, um, I my sales percentage winning was a lot higher than Brett this last year. That's interesting that you, you say that. I, I'll have to take a look at that email. Um, I, I didn't necessarily get that impression, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like I said, I, I, I do think you do a really yeah. great job. Um, but, but ultimately, I think, you know, we're trying to create this brand of being an industry leader. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the last thing I want is for us to look weak. So yeah. I, I just I, I, I just to be want an to industry kind of, leader too. Yeah. yeah. You know, I Absolutely. also want to be an industry leader. Absolutely. And I see how, how we're doing that. And what, so in terms of asking questions, what part of that do you think doesn't work? Well, you know, I, I, it's not even that what you're doing doesn't work. I, I think I just, I really think that a strong approach is going to be better, if that makes any sense. You know, I, I, it's, it's really more about making sure that we are coming from a position of strength. And mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's my main concern mm-hmm. here. Okay. If I were doing it differently, what would you see? Well, I definitely see you um, taking more, uh, taking more of the forward position, you know, and and really showing Mm -hmm. some confidence. Mm -hmm. Would you see, be seeing more closing? Is that what you're thinking? Well, yes, eventually we all want more closing than the year before, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the goal. Um, but I, I just, you know, I think maybe less questions and more assertiveness, something of that mm-hmm. nature would, would be helpful. Yeah, assertiveness. Okay. Well, you know, I, I think this, this is very interesting feedback. However, I think that my style has actually been pretty effective. Well, some of the, um, I, here's a sheet with some of the things that my, um, clients have been saying as far as how they appreciate the style that answers their questions and that it really understands their needs better. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at whatever you brought. Um, like yeah. I said, this is just, this is just me giving you my impressions, you know, nothing, I, nothing I, yeah. particularly I, aggressive or anything. Yeah. Uh, I, like I said, I think you're doing a good job. I'm just trying to give you yeah. some upward feedback. Okay. Okay. Well, I understand that and I'll give it, give it some thought. However, one of the things that I want to make sure is that the company's goals are met. And since I have exceeded my uh, sales goal for this year so far, and um, my, the, from my direct reports, they, it, they seem to be pretty happy and our, um, Look, our turnover is lower than it has been for years. I think that um, that should be taken into account as well when you're thinking about my performance review. Okay, well, you know, uh, you said you sent these things to my email. I'll make sure I'll I'll follow up. I'll send them. I'll send them again. Okay, great. Yeah, I like I said, I, I'm definitely. This is just you know to try and help help you move mm-hmm. forward, and and if you. If you've got some mm-hmm. stuff that you'd like me to see, I, I'll take a look mm-hmm. at it. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm totally, totally just trying to help here. I appreciate that you're trying to help. I really do. And I see that you are looking, you want the best for me and that you want the best for the company. Great. Well, thank you Great. so much for meeting with me today. All right. Thank you. Hi, Kim. How are you Hi. feeling? 
I'm feeling good. But the thing is that I want to make clear here is that it's, it, it, in a meeting like this, you're not going to ch necessarily change hearts and minds. But what your goal is, is to is to not um, not put yourself in a one down position. What do you mean by a one down position? Would you mind elaborating well, if, that on that? If, to not, yeah, to not be back on your heels when you're doing it, like, oh, okay, right, this is personal, not make it all personal. What you want instead is to keep reiterating the outcomes that you're doing and to redirect away from what uh, their stylistic comments are. You know, I understand that that's your opinion, but also keep um, talking about the outcomes for the company. And so when we're thinking about being outcome oriented, that's really what we need to do and try to get it as much as, as possible into specifics um, and observed behavior. And since he wasn't going there, I was, I was stressing outcomes. And that's, uh, so I want to bring that out of what I was doing. I did notice that um, there was a comment in the chat as well that was saying, um, it's a, a bummer when the factual data does not support your bias which I think, <laughs> which is what we were experiencing with Mitchell there. You know, he was saying that you weren't yeah. an effective leader and yet your numbers are just as high, if not higher as right. the, the example that he has cited for you, so. Yeah, and I wish that were an uncommon situation. And yet that is something that I think a lot of people find, uh, feel like we try to, uh, that, that happens, let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump in here because I, I love it. Elizabeth said what that interview made me realize is collect and publicize data. <laughs> Great. That's one of absolutely. the things I was hoping people would take away from that is that you need to be able to gather your own numbers and not wait for other people to, to be the arbiters of your performance and make sure that you are monitoring for yourself. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah, and I, I think um, like kind of where my brain is going is as we were talking about, you know, what are ways to overcome imposter syndrome that, that also reinforces it for yourself to yes. recognize yeah. and see your success and what you've done, you know, um, because I sometimes yeah. I'm shocked by, by the outcome. I'm like, oh, wow, really? Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not sure of this, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but exactly. You, I, that that's helpful to do for yourself as well. Um, and yeah. I just want to say, Nina, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, an extra special thank you to, to Nina because she's uh, being a real trooper and joining us uh, today when she's not feeling her swiftest. So please go rest and be well, but you look good, Nina. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And and on a, on a leaving note, I do think that it's, I agree with what you were saying because something that I've always tried to do for myself in this situation of imposter syndrome is when you look at yourself on paper, what do you see, right? Like take the feelings out of it and kind of look at the objective facts there. And on paper, if you're meeting all of those numbers, you know, if you were looking at this and it didn't have your name listed at the top, it had someone else's name, what would you think about that person? And trying to kind of invert the perspective on it and and give yourself a little more grace. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank I you so that. much. And I, I hope you enjoyed practicing that conversation with Mitchell and I will see you soon. Great, thank Thanks. you so much, Nina. Yeah, I love okay. it. I, I have to agree, Leslie, I was, I was impressed because as I said, how were you able to not be defensive? You offered a lot of evidence contrary to the feedback. Uh, because yeah, it's, it's hard, like that style, it's hard not to take that personally and just. It is. And I, and for myself, I do a lot of repeating of what they just said, you know, I, so my goal is, you know, you, I, I don't want to make, there's a boss and I can't like go on the attack and I can't make them feel totally uncomfortable, although I might wish to, but to leave a little spaces in there for them to maybe possibly think about what they're saying. Yeah, and I, I know um, there were a couple of, of, of great comments. Um, and uh, is it Marina? Let me know in the chat if I'm mispronouncing your name, please. But uh, first off, I'm gonna call out that earlier, mentioned that she was a firefighter and reserve police constable uh, in a very male dominated field and found 
but found less issue in those fields, which she thought was really interesting. So, um, but yeah, you know, I've, I found that, that, that industry makes a really big difference. I've worked in, when I've worked in STEM fields, there's often a, like a, 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 a coming back to objectives. So there can be a little bit more objectivity on this. And when I've worked in things like marketing and more creative fields like that, often style and um, and charisma is what carries the day because we don't always have the objective um, numbers to come back to. I found sometimes. Ah, so. Oh, that yeah. that actually makes a, a lot of sense. Um, she also shared that the the new uh, motto in UK uh, military is to fail, learn, win. Uh, which yes, makes them nice. feel that it's okay to learn through mistakes, which I love. And I think that that really uh, supports exactly what we talk about with Mersion. That's what we say about these simulations is it's a place to, to crash and learn, to go in and do it wrong and, and make those mistakes and fall apart in front of Mitchell, you know, but so that you can go in and then do it right when you have to face that real Mitchell uh, in, in the real world. And there were a lot of people who were like, I've, I've, I've talked to this guy. I've had this, you know, I've dealt with this. Um, and uh, Sarah was pointing out that the, the, avatar, the avatar was talking about like demonstrating, demonstrating, I can't talk today. The avatar was talking about demonstrating strength and confidence, but wasn't really showing a great deal of confidence. But I think that came from and him not really, he didn't have the numbers to support what he was saying. I, and I want to bring out a point about that, actually, which is that um, some research, this research is a little mixed, but some research shows that women, um, even though they definitely get more criticism on style, they sometimes people soft pedal criticism to their face because they don't, they want to keep it pleasant and say nice things, but then they, uh, other things are allowed to fester in the background, actual behavioral things. And so that reduces the quality of feedback that we have which often means it's hard that we're blindsided by things or that people keep talking about just feelings they have. And um, it that changes the quality of feedback when they both want to be nice, but have all of these other prejudices and biases that may that are gonna play in there. And I'm not saying just men have this because women have this as well. Right, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna go back to uh, a, a question we had earlier, which, uh, which was the one that I said was labeled big question. Uh, women aren't wearing 80s style shoulder pads to look like men anymore, but they are still aping the way men do things to be accepted in a male style workplace. What's one thing men could do to send the signal to women, it's okay to lead with a more feminine style? Oh, I love that question. That's fantastic. You know, one of the go-tos and every, I think a lot of people already know this one, but one of the go-tos is for men to make sure that when, that um, to second women's ideas in meetings and to give credit. So Adam Grant has talked a lot about this in terms of when an idea comes up and nobody that's presented by a woman and nobody hears the woman say it. And then the men can say, as you know, Katie said, Da -da 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 -da, and make sure that the credit goes where it is. So I think of that as kind of, uh, they may have a better ability to spike the ball, but what they're doing is they're setting it instead. <laughs> you know, a little volleyball reference here. So that, that way everybody knows whose idea it was and that, that these, these little things as far as communication, as opposed to them just running with it and, and, and where people will remember that it's their idea instead of remembering that it's Katie's idea, these things are so important. Um, as far as what would about a more connective style in general, uh, pointing out what men can point out when women do things and get and are effective. And again, the style things will come up because men have invested a lot of work in learning how to be men, you know? And so just in the same way I was talking about women of an older generation having invested a lot of, to learn how to, to play a more masculine role in business, men have learned that too. And so and he, it might take a minute for them to unlearn that uh, directive is right. And sometimes questioning is actually right in the right situation. But I would say if you're a male person and you want to support women more, start not catching them doing things right, not noticing things that they do that are effective. Um, 
and that may start with just noticing outcomes that are effective and then backtracking. But anyway, you can notice things that are that are creative and maybe not what you would have done, but it seemed to have worked in this case. That's probably going in the right direction. I love that. And you know what? I think that that advice uh, stands true, not just for the men, but for the women as well to do for each other and hopefully seed that where if, if when we're noticing and building and making certain that, that people are getting credit, that, that, that will yeah. encourage others to do the same as well. Um, yeah. And Leslie asked a great question. She said, what are the first three top things a new leader needs to do in a job, in a new job, and a new team to make a positive impression as a top performer from the get-go? Oh, awesome. That's a great question. So that's going to vary a lot depending on your situation. Like what, you know, as I talk about in 90 day leadership, where um, whether you're coming in to rescue a bad thing or whether you're coming in to build on strength, I think that, that the job changes a lot. But in general, if you want to make points with your staff, I would say do a, li do a listening tour again, do like a one-on-one -on -one with everybody and find out what their concerns are and what they would like to see happen. And then out of that list, come up with a couple things that you could actually get done and get those done. Right. Um, and that will demonstrate to them rather than, you know, if you go in and say, you know, we're all going to collaborate now, they're going to be like, yeah, that's what the last person said and it wasn't like that. So especially if you're recovering from a toxic situation or if the leader in front of you was very autocratic, for example, the best thing you can do is to come in there and, um, and show that you're on their side by getting something done that they would like. Excellent. But make it, make it low hanging fruit though, <laughs> because you're gonna have a lot on your plate anyway. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for your participation, for your conversation, for your questions. We're gonna let Kim uh, share just a little bit about her book. Next week, we're gonna sure. have Wendy Taylor Wampler from Indeed with us. The following week, we will have Jennifer Brown talking about uh, how to be an inclusive leader. So we hope that you continue to join us. Uh, but today, a very special thank you to Kim Perkins. And Kim, tell us a little bit about your book before we say goodbye. I'll just click on this really quick to show you that my book is called Winner Take None. And it's about um, personal, it's basically one of those personal into the political books where we're talking about how people's individual experiences of competitiveness end up playing out both in work and in life and where that works really well and where that is not a great idea and how to keep the competitiveness um, in your office from taking over your office culture. This book is going to be out from Georgetown. It's, a, it's not an academic book. It's, for, it's meant for everybody, leader or not. Um, it'll be out at the end of August and it's called Winner Take None. That's right. And as I said, uh, make sure that you're following us on LinkedIn Immersion so that uh, when that comes out, we'll, we're, we're going to put that out there and make sure that you have access to it. Um, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you for, for all of the great uh, conversation and the, the kudos in the chat. We so appreciate you. Um, I This is my favorite part of my week, every week. Thank you for being here. And Kim, thank you for an awesome, awesome conversation. We're going to make sure that everybody has the, um, the link for you for to, to connect on LinkedIn and keep that conversation and for your website as well. We'll include that in the follow-up. And for now, we're at the top of the hour. So everybody have a fabulous, blessed day and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.